Finding America in Bible Prophecy. Why is this so important? Because it has everything to do with events prophesied to take place just before Messiah comes the second time. While working on this truly revolutionary and eye-opening series, we're also working on another. That one is entitled Cyrus the Great and the Prophecy of Daniel 9.25. These are like the opening and closing chapters of the same book. They go hand in hand. Let me explain. Cyrus first. To religious Jews, the first five books of the Bible, that's Genesis to Deuteronomy, written by Moses, are especially sacred. Known as the written Torah, they are transcribed on parchment scrolls and kept in what's known as the Ark of the Law, a sacred enclosure found in every synagogue. On certain occasions, these scrolls are removed and celebrated with much festivity, as is being done here. The word Torah, though, can also be used in a less restrictive sense to refer to all the books of the Jewish Bible some of which give us vital clues about the promised Messiah. Micah, for example, in Micah 5.2, tells us where Messiah would be born, in Bethlehem, Ephrata. David, in Psalm 22, tells us how Messiah would die. They pierced my hands and my feet. Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, tells us why he was pierced. He was wounded for our transgressions. But for our purposes today, one prophet has us in awe. That's because he tells us when Messiah would come the first time. Here's the scripture. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. That's Daniel 9.25. I'm pretty sure most of us know that whether secular or religious, most Jews don't believe Jesus is Messiah. So how do we convince them about his second coming? For that matter, how do we reach Muslims for whom Jesus was simply a prophet and certainly no Messiah? Well, we've taken the position that as implausible as it might seem, convincing both groups isn't really hard at all. Not if our strategy revolves around Daniel. Plus, one other pivotal person, someone whom both Jews and Iranians highly esteem. In Iran, where 90 to 95 percent of the populace identify themselves as Shia Muslims, they may not know a whole lot about Daniel, even though his tomb is right there in the city of Shush in west central Iran. But Iranians flat out revere this other person I'm talking about. I'm referring to the Persian king whose tomb is seen here. That's Kurosh if you're Iranian, Koresh if you're Jewish, Cyrus if you speak English. Kurosh and Daniel joined at the hip. They hold the key to unlock both Islam and Judaism to the first and second coming of Messiah, which is what our series Cyrus the Great and the Prophecy of Daniel 9.25 is all about. That's why we went to Iran to film where most of Daniel's prophecies were given in the first place. While in Iran, as a bonus, mind you, we were able to visit one of its oldest cities, Hamadan, and film inside the tomb of a Jewish couple who are absolutely venerated across Judaism to this day. I'm referring to Mordecai and his cousin Esther, who instituted the holiday Purim, observed annually by Jews around the world on the 14th and 15th days of the Jewish month Adar. Looking back, how can I forget the bazaar in Hamadan, the sparks flying in this little shop, or the meat market, or the absolutely warm people I met all across Iran? How can I forget them from Tehran to Shiraz, Shiraz to Avaz, Avaz to Mashad, Mashad to Nishapur, and Nishapur to Hamidan. These people made my 10 days stay in their country both warm and memorable. And the series we're filming, all that more precious.
I won't say more about the series now other than to say it too is in development. And oh yes, how could I forget? How could I forget the goats which we passed on the way from Cyrus's tomb in Pasadena? Had to ask our cameraman to take some pictures so I could show them to you today. At any rate, after we're through producing series number one, yep, that's after having proven according to the time prophecy given in Daniel 9.25 that Christ is indeed Messiah, we'll still need to breach one more wall in the minds of many Jews. I'm referring to the wall higher than any that ever surrounded Jerusalem, higher even than the famed Ishtar gate to the ancient city of Babylon, which is seen here in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. What wall is higher than these? What am I talking about? I'm referring to the wall of pain and grief that's been seared into the consciousness of the Jews by Satan himself. How? Through centuries of church-sponsored anti-Semitism. That's the wall. You see, to most Jews, the Inquisition, ghettos, tattoos, and Holocaust itself were all, sit for this, Christianity at work. That's how they see it. It's a horrible wall, a horrible caricature. It's a mental block that needs to be shattered to pieces before Jews by their millions will give Christianity even half a chance. Friend, for better or for worse, I take this very, very personally. To me, the perception of Christians as persecutors is as Satan's spittle running down the face of my savior. Satan's spittle, staring every Christian in the face. Satan's spittle, begging to be washed away, even at the risk of losing one's life. For that's what's most likely ahead for anyone daring to tackle this elephant in the room. But love will do that, won't it? Love for Christ will tackle this elephant and wipe that spittle away that my Savior, Jesus Christ should be associated in the Jewish mind with the likes of the Inquisitor Torquemada or Hitler or Mengele or Barbie. This is a master stroke of the devil himself and must be undone. It must be removed before the Jews en masse will give Christianity a second look. That's why we're producing our second series, the one we're going to begin showing you today entitled Finding America in Bible Prophecy. It is in this series that we wipe the spittle away and wash our rags. Though this series ends in the last book of the Christian Bible, that's the book of Revelation, it starts in the Torah with Daniel. What you're about to look at is part one of this second series, Finding America in Bible Prophecy with my homeland, Jamaica, as a backdrop. In this series, we focus on the signs of Messiah's second coming. One of those signs is something we introduce in part one, and which we'll get much further into as the series unfolds. That's America's coming theocracy. The studio sections of part one have all been shot, but we still need to film at several locations in the Middle East and Europe. Part of the terrain crying out to be filmed is the sprawling route used by Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar as he, after having besieged and destroyed Jerusalem in 587 BC, headed back to Babylon with his cargo of Hebrew captives. Captives which of course included Daniel. I'm sure this footage will look a lot like what's on your screen right now. But what I'm showing you is really Hollywood, beloved. This is stock footage shot somewhere in Morocco, which is 2,500 miles away from Jerusalem and 4,000 miles away from Baghdad. No, we want to carry our cameras not to Hollywood, but to the precise terrain over which Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar marched. Here, not here. Once we film along this route, with its identifiable markers, which should prove quite nostalgic to any Jew watching this. Once we stitch these authentic scenes into part one and are able to tell people precisely where we are and what they're looking at, 
Then and only then will we consider the groundwork as having been sufficiently laid for our study of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 to commence. In short, not until this historic ground from Jerusalem to Babylon is filmed will part one be done. We're releasing what we have in our hands today. Yes, it's incomplete, but you'll get a good feel of where we're going because we need your help in finishing both theories. If you like what you're about to see, then at the end, we invite you to come to our website, lrltv.org, and make a donation. We're a non-profit ministry, so your donations are all tax deductible. I'll remind you at the end of this presentation, okay? Now relax and take it in. Finding America in Bible Prophecy, part one of maybe 15, it may be 15 parts before we're through. May God bless you as you watch.
Hi, David Mould here. Welcome to our series of telecasts entitled Finding America in Bible Prophecy. That's the overall title, but we're going to be going in depth into some prophecies here in order to prove to you that when I say this is America, it is America. All right? Back in the day, chances are you saw Ian Boyne and I getting at it in serious heated debate at times, but also in playful disagreement on his program, Religious Hard Talk. I was his guest on at least five telecasts over the years. While I'd like to close this clip with something over which we had our disagreements, I first want to talk to you about COVID-19. I've said it for years, you don't have to be a Christian today to feel in your bones that something big is coming. Not just upon Jamaica, but upon the world. How does COVID-19 fit into this scenario? Is it, is it a sign? I believe it is. Now, I'm not going to get into this speculation about this virus being man-made or that it is somehow associated with 5G networks, no matter how slick or persuasive the presentations that make these points may be. Me, personally, I don't believe any of it, all right? I don't believe any of that stuff, but I do believe COVID-19 is a sign. Along with the increasing frequency of earthquakes, tsunamis, famines and pestilences, etc. I believe COVID-19 is part of a pattern, one more sign of the second coming of Christ, just as he said. Now, I'm not, I'm not setting any dates today, but long before COVID-19, I stated publicly that I personally didn't believe our planet had much more than another decade left. I'm pretty sure I said it on Religious Hard Talk too, for I can remember Ian taking me to task over it calling me a date setter. No, I'm not an idiot. I know no man knows the day nor the hour of Christ's return, but the Bible tells us that we should know the times and the seasons, doesn't it? Matthew 24 is all about those signs. So are Revelation 13 and 17. Well, that's what I'd like to talk to you about today and over the next few episodes of this telecast. The times and the seasons and the signs surrounding the second coming of Christ. Here is how the Apostle Paul put it. That's 1 Thessalonians. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. First Thessalonians 5, 1 to 6. Let's look at this. There are four things here that I want you to note. First, Paul says, you don't need me to write you. Here it is again. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. The times and the seasons of what? The times and the seasons of Christ's second coming. How do we know that's what he's talking about? Because the previous chapter ended with Christ's second coming, with the graves opening up, and with Christ coming in the clouds. Here it is. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's 1 Thessalonians 4. 16 and 17. That's how the previous chapter closed. So that's what he's definitely talking about. The literal, visible, climactic second coming of Christ, which your eyes and my eyes will see according to the word of God. And your ears and my ears will hear. And he says, you don't need that I should write you about this because uno don't know. Don't know what? Don't know the signs. 
The second thing that he does is liken the second coming of Christ to a thief in the night. A thief in the night, catching many people unawares. No, I find this incredible. That after all the signs Jesus and the prophets and Paul have left us, that his coming should be as a thief in the night to anybody with a Bible within their reach. How can this be like a thief in the night? It simply means that the vast majority of us are ignorant, whether willfully ignorant or carelessly ignorant, are just plain ignorant because we don't have Bibles. I don't know. But we're ignorant about the one thing we all should know. I'm talking about the signs pertaining to the climax of this planet's history. How is it going to end? When is it going to end? end. What are the clues? I said, what clues has God given us? Yes, he's given us clues. Many, many clues. Yet many of us seem totally ignorant as though the second coming of the Son of God is a myth, a fairy tale, a farce, as though God never instructed his prophets to write it down plainly for us. What does the Bible say? This is Jesus talking. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's Matthew 24, 27. Do you understand that? Like lightning flashing across the sky, every eye shall see him when he comes in the clouds. Not on the earth, mind you, but when he comes in the clouds. That's what the Bible says. That's where the Bible says we're going to meet him. In Isaiah 24, the prophet Isaiah adds this dimension to it. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. Isaiah 24, 1 and 20. Friend, this is not a Nancy story especially for those of us who profess to believe Christ came the first time some 2,000 years ago. We believe he came. Do we believe he's coming again the second time? This is our Christianity on the line right here. Do you believe Jesus is coming again? Just as the angel said in the book of Acts, in the same manner in which he left in the clouds, literally, visibly. Here is the scripture. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. That's Acts 1, verses 10 and 11. Here it is again in the book of Revelation. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Revelation 1, 7. Every eye shall see him. This is a literal second coming, beloved. Something you and I should prepare for. For the unbelievers and mockers and the wicked will be blotted out in a moment. Slain by the brightness of his coming. Frankly, I find it incredible that especially for those of us living in a nation with so many churches, that most of us don't have a clue about the second coming of Christ. Even animals know, they say, when an earthquake is coming. So what about man, thinking man, intellectual man, smart man, and women, obviously. Graduates of UA and UTEC and NCU and medical school and law school. What about you? Look at this shot of the phone book and the number of churches being shown here. All these churches and yet such a widespread preoccupation across the land 
with the things of this life. That the very thing we should be studying, I'm talking about Christ and his return, is to a great extent crowded out. Maybe that has changed since COVID-19. But to my mind in previous years, it just seemed to me as though we Jamaicans have been busy about everything else. Everything other than the things staring us in our faces. You know, just the other day I was thinking about this, that even out at Port Royal, which I frequently visit when I'm in Jamaica, and which was said to be the wickedest city of the world at one time, they had churches and even a synagogue out in Port Royal, we're told. As you know, to support Royal's churches today, you'd have to dive under the water in the section cordoned off with yellow tape for most of the city was swallowed up by the sea in the earthquake of 1692. Churches and all. But there's one church out there with quite a history. This is St. Peter's Anglican Church. The original church was destroyed in the earthquake. A second church, constructed shortly after, was destroyed by the fire of 1703. This one, however, rebuilt between 1725 and 1726, still stands. In the cemetery is one very famous immigrant. I'm referring to one Louis Galdi, the Frenchman, who, while escaping Roman Catholic persecution in France, for that's what his gravestone says, fled to Jamaica and found notoriety in being spat out of the ground in the Great Earthquake. I can still remember my father telling me about that. Mr. Galdi lived to tell the tale and died on December 22nd, 1739, 47 years after the earthquake at age 80. And this is just one. There are old churches all around Jamaica. Going beyond the phone book, the other day I contacted the Jamaica National Heritage Trust for a list of the oldest churches in Jamaica, for I'm sure we've all heard it. Jamaica is supposed to have one of the highest per capita ratio of churches to people anywhere in the world. Now it turns out this might be just a myth, but as you can imagine, the list we got was quite long. For a while, every last one of those churches was closed because of COVID-19. But thank God, for the most part, they're open again. We can not only drive up to them and admire them and photograph them, we can worship in them. Some of them are situated right near the seaside and make you just want to sit down and relax like, like you would have never leave church. Now, I obviously can't show you all the churches in our land, but Jamaica is full of them. Those on our screen were chosen either for their age, architecture, beauty, or location. Remember, Jamaica was a British colony, so the majority of the older churches are Anglican or Church of England. The two on North Street in Kingston are not. This one on the campus of St. George's College is Roman Catholic and was founded in 1850. Man, what a shot. Look at that on your screen. What a shot. And while this one almost just across the street from it is the North Street Seventh-day Adventist Church, it was founded in 1900. Now this church on Orange Street in Kingston has particular meaning to me. It's the assembly hall of the Christian brethren. I used to pass it every time I went downtown on the bus as a child, and I've never forgotten that sign. Prepare to meet thy God. A few years ago, I had the privilege of going inside that church for the first time as we interviewed a dear saint whom we saw struggling to make her way to church one Sunday morning. Deceased now, she was 80-year-old Ruby Carrington. Remember now, we're looking at churches this morning as we ponder the words of the Apostle Paul that Christ's second coming will be as a thief in the night for many. With so many churches around, even in the high crime inner city communities of Denham Town and Tivoli Gardens in West Kingston, even in the poorer communities that have grown up around what was at one time top-class areas of Kingston. I know, because my parents told me, churches like this one, the Wesley Methodist Church on Tower Street, which has been vandalized many times, 
I find it incredible that anyone here in my homeland should be ignorant of the second coming of Christ. So the question this morning, rhetorical for sure, is this. How many of the sanctuaries across our land reared up to give glory to God and his son, having an eye toward the second coming of Christ? How many of them really do have an eye towards that second coming? I hope all of them. All right? What have we said thus far? What does Paul tell us in this passage in 1 Thessalonians 5? One, you don't need me to write you. Two, Christ's coming will be like a thief in the night. The third thing Paul does in this passage is liken the second coming of Christ to a woman in labor. Listen to him. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.3. Labor pains. Ask any woman who has given birth. Those pains might be slow at the beginning, but as the time comes for that baby to be born, those pains become sharper and more intense. That's what the second coming of the Lord will be like, like labor pains. The signs of his appearing will become more rapid and more intense over the years. To my mind, without a doubt, COVID-19 is one of those signs for Christ, especially pointed to pestilences or disease of every stripe as one of the signs that would precede his second coming. But David, you might say, pestilences have been around from man has been on the earth. Why is this one a sign and not polio or the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 that infected an estimated five hundred million people and killed 50 million? I'll give you the answer. It has to do with where we are in the history of our planet, beloved. If the Bible is to be believed, we're on the border of our 6,000th year since Adam. You know what that means? As a friend of mine put it, we're about to push. That's a woman, of course, using that language. For those of you watching this on the internet who may not be Jamaican, that term about to push is normally associated with a woman at the point where she has to push, has to contract her muscles to push that infant out. That's what my friend was saying. This planet is about to push. But I'll get back to that. I promise. All right. The next thing Paul says is this. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. First Thessalonians 5, 4, and 5. Here the Apostle Paul tells us, while the second coming of Christ may be like a thief in the night for many, not so for the believer. At least it shouldn't be so. We who know our Bibles, we who know prophecy, we who know the signs of his second coming, we are the children of light. Because of the ignorance of Bible prophecy, the world has lost so much. But we who know the word, we who know what the Bible predicts, we who know what is coming should be able to teach it, and are in fact on the obligation to teach it to rich and to poor, the small man and the prime minister, if he's watching, as I am doing this day. We should be able to teach it to all. Preaching it, though, can come with quite a price. But I won't say more than this right now. Here is Jesus in what's known as the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That's Matthew 28, 19 and 20. These are Jesus' marching orders to his followers, and that's why I'm opening my mouth today. He said, go and teach and that's what I'm doing today. COVID-19 and the fears and uncertainty and conspiracy theories surrounding COVID-19 make it imperative that I open my mouth today. 
Why? Because I fear too many of us, while we might sense something coming, we don't have a clue as to what it really means. And that, that really doesn't sit well with me at all. That I should know what is coming. And that my church should know what is coming. And yet you not know what is coming. Come, my friend. If you have a desire to know what else is coming, then let's open our Bibles together. You know, what I said about COVID-19 being a sign, much more so than the Spanish flu, it's it, it sort of bothering me. I don't want to get into the issue of the 6,000 years just yet, for that's going to involve taking our cameras far, far away to the Greek island of Patmos, to which the oldest surviving disciple, John, had been banished. Why? I'll let him tell you. John tells you why he was banished. He says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's Revelation 1.9. John was banished to the isle of Patmos for the word of God. Let me tell you something. And it's not in the Bible, but we're told, Tertullian tells it and others, that John was cast into a pot of boiling oil by the Emperor Domitian. And when he wouldn't boil, and they pulled him out and there was no harm on him, that's when he got banished to Patmos. Like I said, it's not in the Bible, that's tradition. Those were the days, my friend, when you paid a price for being a Christian. John paid that price. Back then, Patmos was a penal colony a barren place, a desolate place, a place where the Roman emperors banished criminals. But look at it today. It is believed that the book of Revelation, which sheds enormous light on the concept of our earth having been allotted 6,000 years, might actually have been written from this cave. But let's save that for later. After we find America in the Bible, we can tackle the notion of all this planet has is 6,000 years, which I happen to believe, by the way. Today I'd like to wrap up this section of our talk by pointing you to one verse from the lips of Jesus. Whether it's 10 years or 10 days we have left on this planet, he's the person to whom I'd like to point you today. So whether you're from St. Catherine, St. Thomas, St. James, or anywhere in between, today, especially now, as we continue to adjust to this pandemic, I'd like you to consider something Jesus said. Here it is. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. That's Luke 21, 28. What is Jesus saying? When we see the signs of the end of this planet, yes, I said the end of this planet. When you see the signs begin to come to pass, we should do what? Look up. Elsewhere in the same chapter, he said we should pray that we may be accounted worthy to escape these things. Here it is. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's Luke 21, 26. So look up, then pray. Look up, survey the scene, use your intellect, your brain, your mind. Take it all in. Take what in? The signs that are all around us from the startling frequency of earthquakes across our globe to the oddity of tsunamis. I say oddity because tsunami is something I never even heard about as a picnic growing up. Tsunami, what is that? To rivers across the world, even here in Jamaica, turning blood red. Take it all in, beloved. With famine and pestilences and wars and rumors of wars, take it all in, just as Jesus said. Now I should tell you this morning that one of the signs of Jesus' second coming is something that I often disputed with Ian. On the air and off. Publicly, he claimed not to believe it, but I believe secretly he did. That something has to do with the emergence of a theocracy in the United States. That's a government in which the church, for the most part, calls the shots. 
You can find that prophecy in the Bible and I'll not only show you, I'll prove it to you as though we're in a court of law. I'll prove it to you line upon line, precept upon precept. I'll prove it to you so clearly you will never be the same. Your Bible will never be the same. By the time we're finished, you'll understand the beast, his image, his mark. You'll understand why the Bible is more relevant and credible than CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News. It's more valuable than a million PhDs and a million winning lottery tickets. What could possibly make it so valuable? It has the future all laid out for you as a giant roadmap. That's what. Listen, let's go back to Ian. Remember what I said? Publicly, Ian claimed not to believe in the emergence of a theocracy in the United States. And on more than one occasion, on more than one telecast, he, he would come back to this point and say, David, how could America, this secular nation, ever be brought to the point where she would embrace a theocracy? He would virtually laugh at me. Some of you remember it. He would laugh at me publicly on the ear. But in that dressing room, in TVJ's dressing room, before the programs were recorded, he would open up and reasoned more like one who believed these things, or at least gave them credence. I said he reasoned more like one who, while in his heart, he might have believed in the notion of a theocracy, he found it politically expedient to adopt a public stance that scoffed at this concept. I mean, can you imagine? With the American embassy just up the road, how long do you think Ian would have survived if he had publicly come out and said, there's a theocracy coming to your country and pretty soon flights to Jamaica are going to be full of people running from it? Please note though, that even in scoffing, Ian knew he was at least engaging in the conversation that highlighted the very thing about which he was ostensibly scoffing. You get what I'm saying? That's how he saw himself as being of service. He told me that more than once. He would facilitate the conversation before the whole island. Bottom line, I don't know how much he really disagreed with the notion of an emerging theocracy. Like I said, I believe he believed it and knew it was coming, but felt it expedient not to acknowledge it publicly. And when I said, by the way, how long would he have survived? I mean, how long would the management of TVJ tolerated him saying that sort of thing? Not that I expected anybody was going to kill Ian over it. The question is, how long would they have tolerated that view? Even though it might have been biblically sound, it sounded so far-fetched, he wouldn't come out and say it. Knowing that I wanted to discuss the emergence of just such a theocracy for our last telecast, which neither of us knew would be our last, I actually ran the following promo on TVJ back in December of 2016. Come, let's look at it. Hi, David Mould here. Some of you are still in shock over the Trump victory. Let me politely address Ambassador Moreno and the US Embassy staff. The State Department won't tell you this because they don't know. But according to the Bible, there are more shocks ahead. Let your colleagues know. Let the President know. Most of us would probably live to see a theocracy emerge right there in the United States. Theocracy? Yes, with the church in control of the state. On Villagers Hard Talk next Tuesday night, I'll tell you more. Theocracy? That's what I said then. Today, almost four years later, I'm saying even more. Look closely. This shot on your screen pretty much sums up what I believe the Bible teaches about what is coming to America. How could it happen in America? I'll tell you. For one, let's never forget President Trump's pledge to grant more power to the church. Here he is saying it himself. I'm Protestant, I'm Presbyterian. Are you surprised to hear that? Yeah. <laughs> the, the power of, of our our group of people together. I mean, if you add it up, I was trying to do it the other day. I was with one of the, the great ministers. And I said, you know, if you think about this country, because now you're talking about men and women, you're talking about together. So the group is larger, 
Christians, Christians in this country is larger than men or women. And I said, how many Christians do you think? And it could be like 240, 250 million, you know, a big portion of, and yet we don't exert the power that we should have. Now, I think some of the churches are afraid of their tax status, to be honest. You know, they're afraid they're going to lose their tax status if they get too political. Um, some of them just can't endorse. But, you know, the fact is that there's nothing the politicians can do to you if you band together. You have too much power. But the Christians don't use their power. And, by the way, Christianity will have power without having to form. Because if I'm there, you're going to have plenty of power. You don't need anybody else. You're going to have somebody representing you very, very well. Remember that. While much of the world focused on COVID-19, in the United States, key moves continued to be made that were no doubt helping to fulfill that pledge. Like what? Like the lifetime appointment of federal judges. What's there to fear from that? Well, there's a movement that's been flying under the radar for years in America, and it's known as Dominion Theology. Its thesis, that America must be ruled by Christians, tasked with implementing God's laws across the land. How many recent judicial appointments adhere to that theology? Time will tell. Before we move on today, let's summarize one more time. All right, what have we said today? Paul says, you don't need me to write you. That's the first thing. Second, Jesus' coming will be like a thief in the night. Third, it will be like a woman in labor. Believers are not in darkness. That's number four, like the rest of the world. There is one sign over five. There is one sign over which Ian and I had our public disagreements, but I believe in his soul he believed it. That issue is the emergence of a theocracy in the United States of America. It's one of the signs to precede Christ's second coming, and it can be found in the Bible, and I promise you by God's grace, I'll show you. That's what we've said so far. All right, now let's dig in. Where is America found in the Bible? In what verse or verses? That's the question today. It's such an important question that we'll need to pray much as we study and not be careless or superficial in our analysis. Even though we're going to end up in the New Testament, we must start off in the Old, specifically in the book of Daniel. We've got to start there if we're to answer this question, where is America in Bible prophecy? For that's where the foundation of our journey is. That's where the smoking gun is. That's where the history is. That's where the clues are in Daniel. These are clues that frankly could get us killed as we expose them to the light of day. For they resurrect a history that's been deliberately hidden from us. But we're going to sniff them out today. At least we're going to start sniffing them out. For it's going to take more than one telecast to do this. Like Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, it's going to take some time to work our way through from the city of destruction to the celestial city. In fact, our foundation over these next few telecasts, and it could, could be a dozen or more, may be much deeper than is strictly necessary, but I am making it deep. I'm taking the responsibility on my own shoulders. I'm making that foundation deep and broad and airtight because I know that after it has been presented, especially here on TVJ, it will have to stand up under the most severe, rigorous, and determined cross-examination from those who would like to say this history never occurred. This foundation must be so deep that, that the lawyers for the defense will be hard-pressed to challenge it. So be prepared. In the process of our journey, we're going to go to several countries to view for ourselves key pieces of art that will help frame our foundation. But there's one more reason we're going. We're going with our small but dedicated film crew to procure equally priceless video. Video that will hammer home in your mind the strength 
of our foundation and the accuracy of this trail that will ultimately lead us to America in the Bible. Now I'm not being funny here, but as we speak about going to look for America, there's a song running through my mind, Lord have mercy upon David Moore. You know what that song is? It's Simon and Garfunkel singing, how did they put it? They've all come to look for America. Well, that's what we're doing today. We're looking for America. All right, let's begin. Father God, please help us. No less than you help Columbus as he set sail from Spain with the Pinta, the Nina, and the Santa Maria. May you help us today as we start our sacred journey. We're looking for America, dear Lord, but not across the Atlantic and not from Saginaw. We're looking for America in your sacred word, the Bible. May you open the eyes of everyone watching this as to the value of this gem, this journey, and to the nearness of the second coming of your Son. Lead us today, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. What a piece of irony. You know something? Like Columbus, we too are going to begin our journey from Gesswil, Spain. You see this picture on your screen? It's a painting by the 17th century Spanish artist Juan de la Corte and is entitled The Burning of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar's Army. There is some scholarly debate about the date of this event, this burning, but the consensus is that it took place either in 587 or 586 BC. I felt this painting was so important for our search for America in the Bible that we actually tracked it down to this location on your screen in Spain. It's going to be one of the shots in the book that we're publishing, the revised edition of the new illustrated great controversy. But I also wanted it here in our opening session of this presentation. What led us to it? The disagreement between Ian Boyne and I that a theocracy will emerge in America. That's what has led us to it. To prove that that theocracy will come, it's important to look at the groundwork being laid for a monumental shift in American jurisprudence today. But that by itself is insufficient. To absolutely prove that this revolution is coming, we must first find America in the Bible. Once that's done, we can then lay out our case for the coming theocracy. You follow what I'm saying? We have to find America first before we can talk about a theocracy in America. So we're in search of America this morning and we're starting with this painting right here in Spain. De La Corte's painting captures one of the most tragic chapters in Israel's history, Jerusalem. Israel's capital, and the site of their temple, once located somewhere up here on the Temple Mount, is about to be plundered, its temple destroyed, and thousands of Jews taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. In Psalm 137, we find these words, by the rivers of Babylon which many of us Jamaicans can repeat from memory because they're a part not just of the Rastafarian culture, but I dare say of the Jamaican culture and music. Here it is. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Sing us one of the songs of Zion. This psalm no doubt reflects the mood of many Jews who had been taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. You may better understand this mood if you look on a map and see how far from Jerusalem they had to walk. Better yet, let's take a flight over to Baghdad in Iraq. From there, we'll drive the 50 miles to Hillah, to the ruins of ancient Babylon. 
by the rivers of Babylon. Were the Jews ever here by this branch of the Euphrates? Most likely, for the Euphrates actually ran under Babylon's walls and figures largely in an upcoming episode. Now as for the Jewish males, I don't know how many were turned into eunuchs by the Babylonians, but among the unfortunate victims was young Daniel. We know this because the man who became his master is listed as Ashpenaz, the captain of the eunuchs. So much for the background. Sometime after the captivity, in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar is asleep in his royal city, pictured here in this British museum, and he has a dream he can't remember. Nor can his wise men and magicians show him, but the young prophet Daniel can. God not only shows the captive Daniel Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but gives him the interpretation. Can you imagine that? You can't remember your own dream, but God raises up somebody to tell you what you were dreaming. How is that for a sign? And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. That's Daniel 2, 1 to 4. Basically, the king is saying, you are all wise men and magicians. This is what I pay you to do. Tell me, what did I dream last night? The something not bother me. Me no remember what me did dream, but me know that it's something important. Tell me, me say, oh, what me did dream? And he threatens them. Let's go back to the Bible. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I will know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, there is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asked any such thing of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requires. And there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause, the king was very angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. That's Daniel 2, 5 to 12. So did they die? All right, let's take a break here and come back next week to see what happened. God bless you, Jamaica. Keep focused. And as the sign on your screen says, prepare to meet thy God. Finding America in Bible prophecy. Why is this so important? Because it has everything to do with events prophesied to take place just before Messiah 
comes the second time. Well, there you have it. I hope you liked what you've just seen as we set the stage for what could end up being a 15-part study of Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and that final climactic chapter where America is revealed to the world in the book of Revelation. What's left for part one? As I said at the beginning and during the telecast, we want to follow Nebuchadnezzar with our cameras as he heads to Babylon with his cargo of bereaved souls. Avoiding the desert, but which back in Nebuchadnezzar's day would have meant a semi-suicidal 560 mile march. The Babylonians no doubt opted for the longer but less onerous 1600 mile trip along what's known as the Fertile Crescent. There before them would be water, lots of water, without which neither Nebuchadnezzar, nor his soldiers, nor his oxen, nor his camels would survive. Besides, was he not now leading Jewish women and children too? Opting to steer his caravan by the Euphrates would have been a no-brainer. That's why we want to go deeper into the Middle East. We want our audience to take this journey with Daniel on foot, we want their feet to swell, just like the Jewish captives did. We want them to feel the overbearing heat and to realize the cost at which some prophets have bequeathed their messages to the world. In the case of Daniel, his prophecies are particularly tragic, not just because he was ripped away from his family as a child, not just because he had to survive this incredible 1600 mile forced march to a strange land, there to live with a people whose language he didn't understand and had to learn. No, Daniel endured so much more. His priceless prophecies, whether they be about Christ on the one hand or the Antichrist on the other, come to us through bereavement, captivity, and sadly, castration. And don't let that word castration shock you, please. Here is Isaiah prophesying to King Hezekiah 100 years before Daniel was born. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Isaiah 39, 7. Have you ever wondered why the Bible refers to Daniel's master as Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs? Well, that's why. Somewhere along the line, he had been emasculated by Babylonian surgeons. Yet he humbled himself and gave us his classic prophecies just as God gave them to him. How did that man bring himself to do that? How could any man? Had I been in Daniel's shoes after that castration, I'd have been ready to curse God. Like Job's wife suggested that he, Job, should do. Curse God and die, she said in Job 2.9. So yes, heeding her advice, I'd have been ready to tell God, if you couldn't save me from these butchers, then why should I prophesy for you? No, give your dreams and visions to somebody else. Is that reckless enough for you? Wrapped up in grief and self-pity, that's precisely what I'd probably have said, but not Daniel, which no doubt is one of the reasons why the angel Gabriel refers to Daniel as being greatly beloved in Daniel 9.23. In fact, three times in the space of two chapters, Daniel is called greatly beloved. Not even David got that. Greatly beloved, no doubt, because Daniel was in total submission to God. Even Job murmured when he had to endure the boils and the scraping and the ashes and the bereavement. Yes, he lost his children and the pain and the isolation. Yes, the isolation and then the ostracism that came from his friends. In Job 7, 11 to 15, we read, and this is Job talking to God, Therefore I will not refrain my mouth. No, minna shut my mouth. That's what the man said. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I a sea or a whale 
that thou settest a watch over me? When I say my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaints. Then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifiest me through visions. So that my soul chooseth strangling and death rather than my life. I loathe it. I would not live always. Let me alone for my days are vanity. Job 7, 11 to 15. Did you hear that? Let me alone. In Jamaica we would say, left me. Me don't want you bother with me. Yes, Job complained. Daniel, as far as we know, God bless him, Daniel submitted. Me, as I said, I suspect I would have cursed. And that, as poet Robert Frost said, has made all the difference. That's why Daniel is in the Bible and not me. With Daniel and his master, Ashpenaz, as a very real backdrop, Maybe now you can better understand the psyche of those Jews who have walked away from God, even if they didn't curse. Mystified, in incredible pain, some bitter and in total disgust, especially after the sadism and sheer demonic horrors of the Holocaust. They walked away from God, gave up their faith in God. To these Jews and to millions before them, no doubt, it's like the Jewish race has been singled out for torture, singled out for pain. How did the psalmist put it? Thou hast showed thy people hard things. Thou hast made us to drink the wine of astonishment. That's Psalm 60 and verse 3. Psalm 44 is even more blunt. Yea, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That's Psalm 44, 22. Friend, that incessant hatred and pain would be enough to demoralize anybody. Just like Daniel's castration, which is the point I'm trying to make. Daniel's pain and humiliation are emblematic of Israel's pain. Jewish pain. That's why I want our audience to feel what he had to have felt, yet still humbled himself to be a spokesperson for God. I want to put flesh and bones on this man. In the absence of any scriptures to the contrary, I want our audience to grasp what certainly appears to be Daniel's incredible, long-suffering character. I want to make him real. Tell you the truth. I want our audience not just to feel his pain, I want them to fall in love with him long before he utters a word. Today we need your help. We've already spent over $12,000 just in filming what you have just watched. In sharing this figure with you, am I admitting too much? As one of my colleagues says I'm doing, she says I chat too much. Well, I don't really think so. I think you need to know what goes into producing good, solid, compelling video. You see those churches in Jamaica? Don't you know we had to hire a local cameraman with a drone to get those shots? Some shots were quite risky. For while he was on Tower Street, for example, in downtown Kingston, there to get the shot of the Wesley Methodist Church, he was in a very rough area. Men from the community actually came up to him to ask him what he was filming and why. Heart pounding at that point he knew it was time to go. While he didn't exactly fear for his life, he told me that he didn't want to be yet one more victim of a robbery or something worse in broad daylight. What am I saying? These shots cost, beloved. And then when it's not our cameraman being used, we had to purchase stock footage. Footage of the absolutely beautiful waters of Patmos, for example. Or of the pain of the delivery room. Or the lightning flashing through the clouds at Christ's second coming. And then to top it off, there's the animation of Daniel's image, which is coming in part two. First, our editor had to buy that image. 150 pounds is what it cost him. Then he had to figure out how to fold its arms, for it came initially with both arms outstretched. To fold its arms, he had to learn how to put virtual bones inside the image and how to bend the image at the joints. 
Then he had to put a sheen on the gold, the silver, the brass. For that task, lighting was everything. Then he had to animate the image. It had to be able to turn 360 degrees in any direction. By itself, that animation, which includes, of course, the stone crushing the image, took three 12-hour days. Three 12-hour days for maybe 90 seconds of video. And then a couple more days, days, not hours, of serious polishing, right down to the portrayal of the wind carrying away the remnants of the gold, silver, brass, iron, and clay, like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. That had to be done if we were to be true to the scriptures. Next, the stone becoming a mountain. That had to be animated too. For that's how Daniel described it in Daniel 2.35. Why go to all this trouble? One, to bring the scriptures alive. Two, to help our audience to see as best as we can portray the scene, what Nebuchadnezzar saw as he was dreaming. We've gone to all this trouble because we want to plant, that's number three, pictures and emotions where possible in people's minds. Plant them there so forcefully that they'll never forget. Wherever they go in life, our audience must remember Nebuchadnezzar's image and ponder what the God of the Torah was saying through it. But at all costs, as I said, part one cost us over $12,000 and this doesn't include the funds we spent traveling to Iran in 2019 and filming there. You get the point? Taking our cameras along Nebuchadnezzar's route, as we're doing here, will cost us tens of thousands of additional dollars. But I believe this journey will be particularly nostalgic and persuasive, especially to the Jews, many of whom will recognize Lebanon and Syria and Iraq. These were their forefathers being emasculated and hauled off as slaves by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. These were their infants being dashed against the stones, as Psalm 137 describes. Filming this journey, or at least taking our cameras along this pain-filled route, could melt hearts that might otherwise remain as hard as stone. That's why I want to do it. And yes, we can film along this route. There are traces of the Via Maris, maybe satellite imagery, who knows, to this day, but I know it's there, waiting to be filled. I believe this venture will help bring Daniel and his prophecies and the mysteries of God alive. Traveling on the ground through Caesarea and Lebanon, parts of Turkey and Syria and Iraq will be worth it. Just watching the sun set over the ruins of ancient Babylon will be worth it. You know, when you add it all up, based on how much it cost us to produce part one, as I said, that's $12,000 for part one alone without any travel expenses. Finishing what could be a combined 15 to 20 parts to these two series could cost us upwards of $200,000 more. And no, I'm no longer hesitant or embarrassed to quote this figure. Fearing that some people would think me mad I've tended to prepare a budget only for one piece or one segment at a time and downplayed what is staring us in our faces, but not anymore. COVID-19 has changed all of that. We don't have time to romp. We don't have time to play. Time is too short now for what in reality could be my false humility. No, let me lay out our expenses just as honestly and comprehensively as I can. What we're producing could end up costing us way in excess of $200,000. And no, I'm not in awe of this figure. No more than was David in awe of Goliath's biceps. It's real. It's staring us in our faces. It's a mountain to climb. The good thing though is this. In taking us first to Iran, God has already shown he is for this project. We've already left port in short. Friend, I believe that the same God who sustained Daniel will provide every penny for us to go forward just as he did for the renowned British Egyptologist Howard Carter. 
Here is Carter's story in a nutshell. You never heard about him? I'm going to tell you. Arriving in Egypt at age 17, he'd, he'd end up being involved in sundry archaeological digs until World War I interrupted them in 1914. During the war, Carter would work as a courier and translator for the British, but resumed excavations at the war's end in 1918. Somewhere along the way, Carter earned the support of a notable benefactor, one Lord Carnarvon, who initially sponsored him with high expectations, but who himself became disillusioned as year after year of digging turned up little or nothing. Finally, in 1922, Carnarvon pulled the plug, but Carter, no longer 17, I forget how old he was in 1922, closer to 50, Carter, naturally distressed, persuaded him to continue one more year. The rest is history. Within a few months, Carter discovered King Tut's tomb. Even then though, it took him 10 more years of excavating before it was all over. Was this campaign in Egypt's heat worth the years of digging? Of course it was. Look at this on display in the Museum of Egyptian Antiquities in Cairo. This is King Tut's burial mask, carved into 11 kilograms or 24 pounds of solid gold. For 3,000 years, it lay buried until one day Carter's water boy stumbled over a set of steps that, upon close examination and further excavation, led to the sealed tomb. Friend, I believe it was God who inspired Carter with the tenacity to keep on digging and no doubt an angel who tripped the water boy at the right time, at the right place. They never even knew those steps were there until the boy tripped. Yes, our God is just like that. The story of Howard Carter is one of the reasons why I persevere. One of the reasons why I believe our God will take us back to the Middle East just as he took us to Iran. Like Elijah, even after God had promised rain in 1 Kings 18.1, we've still got to ask for the rain, just like Elijah. Go look it up. It's there in 1 Kings 18. God promises Elijah rain in verse 1. But before Elijah gets that rain, he has to send his servants to the mountaintop seven times. So no, I'm not expecting God's manna to fall on us just so. We must play our part. We must do everything we can to generate that rain. You follow what I'm saying? Which is why, as I've said, we've released this video today. Our part is to ask for the necessary funds. We've already asked God. Now it's time to ask you. Will you partner with us today? Can you partner with a team that will be as nitpicky about quality as is our team? Can you partner with somebody who will be as real and open and recklessly honest with you as I have just been in taking you through how I would have probably responded to God had I been in Daniel's shoes? Can you partner with me? Prior to watching this, had you ever considered what the Babylonians did to Daniel? Hasn't it already affected how you feel about that man? But I'll go one better. Having watched what we've produced in part one thus far, can you understand the Jewish mindset a little better today? Yes, you say? Then it will all have been worth every penny, won't it? Even my blunt language about Daniel's surgery will have been worth it if it brings God's word alive. Alive, not just for you, but for the thousands of Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and Arabs and Christians who will watch it. How can I be so sure these two series of videos will draw large numbers of Jews and Iranians? Well, let's talk about the Jews first. Let me give you 10 seconds of video that can be fed across social media and reach millions of Jewish homes and businesses in seconds. Take a look. We're inside the tomb of 
Esther and Mordecai in Hamadan, Iran. What Jew do you think will be able to resist that? Of course that's Hebrew. What does it say in English? The tomb of Mordecai and Esther in Iran. No, Jews won't miss the opportunity of stepping inside the tomb of Mordecai and Esther, who have played such a key part in their upbringing and continue to play such a seminal role in their culture to this day. They'll click on it. For one, with all the talk of war and recent assassinations in Iran, from that general who got taken out by a drone to the nuclear scientist who got taken up by a remote set machine gun. With all of that talk, few Jews are going to travel to Iran today to enter that tomb for themselves, no matter how much they venerate that couple. But they'll click on our ad to see more. I'm sure of it. And when they do click, where will that take them? It'll take them to 30 more seconds of video. Come, let me show you. Why did we come here? We came to Iran because we wanted to tackle one prophecy in the Bible. Daniel 9.25, the verse predicting the year Messiah would come the first time. With that in mind, I'd like to invite you to watch us as we put the pieces together for our brand new blockbuster video series. Kurash, if you're Iranian. Cyrus, if you speak English. And Koresh, if you're Jewish. Cyrus the Great and the prophecy of Daniel 9.25. Friend, watching these few seconds of video will be like getting the eyes sensitized to light after one has been in a cave for a long time. We can't just rush a Jewish audience to watch hours of video, no matter how compelling it may be. They've got to be sensitized, taken to it in stages. Only after they've been through the first 10 seconds and then the follow-up 30 seconds, which tells them what they're about to see, will we lift up the curtains on Cyrus the Great and the prophecy of Daniel 9.25. Esther and Mordecai first. Iran second. Then Cyrus the Great and the prophecy of Daniel 9.25. The same kind of advertising will be done to attract Muslims. But I'm not going to give everything away here. And let me be quick to add all glory to Jesus, who promised his followers, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. All glory to him, who promised in the great controversy, page 606, to lead the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. I know it is God who is leading our minds as we continue to plead with him for the spirit of excellence to fall upon us just as it fell upon Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, who constructed the ark and the mercy seat and the cherubim for the tabernacle of the Lord in Exodus 31. Here is what God told Moses about this man. Bezalel, the man whom he, the living God, had chosen for the sacred job of furnishing and beautifying the tabernacle. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. That's Exodus 31, 3 to 5. The spirit of excellence is what I've prayed will be poured out, and in particular upon our editor. I believe it is being poured out. Did you see what he did with Nebuchadnezzar's image, my friend? This is precisely the reason why we have our 501c3 non-profit status. It is for moments like this, for projects like this, broad in scope, spanning the terrain from Jerusalem to Turkey and Baghdad. Projects requiring major investments and a lot of faith. 
anticipating the latter rain and the loud cry, how can we do less? No, there is an Israel and an Islam to be one, absolutely one. Two world religions to be challenged at their core. All that plus an antichrist to be exposed. How can we not want to be part of the final movements? Audacious? Of course I know our plans are audacious. Having two world religions convert to Christianity, that is beyond audacious. There is no word that has yet been invented to describe what we're attempting. Whether you're talking Hebrew or Babylonian or Iranian or English, that word hasn't been invented. The only thing that comes close to my mind is, is, is Jonathan and his armor bearer going into the camp of the Philistines by themselves. I want to bring Holy Ghost inspired weapons to the table that God can use mightily in these closing days. And these two series, Cyrus the Great and the Prophecy of Daniel 9.25 and Finding America in Bible Prophecy, I believe these are part of that weaponry to be followed, God sparing my life, by the revised edition of the new illustrated great controversy. Frankly, after 49 years of tending sheep in Midian, I believe our time has come. While we need every donation we can get and will not neglect the $5 or $25 or $100 gifts, I believe there is at least one person watching this today. Some Lord Carnarvon, somewhere out there, who can fund everything we want to do in the Middle East. Just as easily as you or I would run to the supermarket to buy a few pounds of grapes. Am I talking to you today, Lord Carnarvon? You're sitting on millions, maybe billions of dollars. And yet, prior to watching this telecast, nothing had really gripped your imagination to its core. Now, though, your soul is on fire. You've caught the vision. You've heard the voice of God himself, that still small voice speaking inside your heart and saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. You see America changing right before your eyes and you know what could be just around the corner isn't pretty. You know it means perilous times just ahead. Sir or Madame, for Lord Canaveral, maybe Lady Canaveral today, I don't know. Sir or Madame, with all due respect, it is time to move, time to act, time to give of your means in a different way with a new intensity to different people, even to lay people who understand the times and who are preparing evangelistic tools for the battle ahead. Lay people, my friend, who have an eye to the second coming of the Lord. Lay people who are not just sitting back at a desk, even though that too is important, especially if you're my treasurer. But lay people who will risk their lives to see the work done. Lest you think reaching Jews with the gospel is a pipe dream, let me show you what God's servant has to say about it. While amplifying Paul's prophecy in Romans 11 about a revival coming to Israel, listen to how she spells out that revival in the book Acts of the Apostles. That's the last book she ever wrote. Listen to this gem. In the closing proclamation of the gospel, when special work was to be done for classes of people hitherto neglected, God expects his messengers to take particular interest in the Jewish people whom they find in all parts of the earth. As the Old Testament scriptures are blended with the new in an explanation of Jehovah's eternal purpose, this will be to many of the Jews as the dawn of a new creation, the resurrection of the soul, as they see the Christ of the gospel dispensation portrayed in the pages of the Old Testament scriptures and perceive how clearly the New Testament explains the old, their slumbering faculties will be aroused and they will recognize Christ as the savior of the world. Many will by faith receive Christ as their redeemer, 
to them will be fulfilled the words, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Among the Jews, she says, are some who, like Saul of Tarsus, are mighty in the scriptures. And these will proclaim with wonderful power the immutability of the law of God. The God of Israel will bring this to pass in our day. His arm is not shortened that it cannot save. As his servants labor in faith for those who have long been neglected and despised, his salvation will be revealed. Acts of the Apostles, page 381. Remember, if you live in America, you can get a tax deduction for your gift. Won't you come to our website and make that donation now? It's www.lrltv.org. Or if you are not internet active, or if it's a particularly large check, Lord Canavran, Sister Canavran, if that's you sending something in, don't do it by PayPal. Just make your check or money order payable to Laymen for Religious Liberty Ministries, LRL Ministries for short. That's LRL Ministries, Post Office Box 1029, Deland, Florida, 32721. About the only thing I can give you in return is this booklet in my hand, my trip to Iran. And if you ask for it, we'll also send you the DVDs about that trip, which of course includes footage of our entering the tomb of Mordecai and Esther in Hamadan. Here's the tomb here. There we are inside the tomb. My friend, I'd be happy to send these. They're the pride and joy of our ministry ranking right up there with our Time Magazine ad for the great controversy, which you can read about at our website. Six solid pages featuring God's servant, the health message, a center spread, speaking about what's coming to America, and then some religious liberty quotes. You can read all about it at our website. Listen. Thank you so much for your kindness, for taking the time to listen to me today. From start to finish, hasn't this been a wonderful journey today? Can you sense the breadth and depth and power and scope of what we're trying to produce? As I said, there is no word. Audacious isn't the, doesn't come close. This is beyond audacious. We're challenging Islam and Judaism and opening, proposing to open in excess of a billion eyes. Yes, you can. You have sensed what we're about. You've caught a glimpse of it in part one. In your bones, you know, you absolutely know these two series are from God himself. Well, may that same God richly bless you today. That's my prayer. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Amen.